Hello and assalamu alaikum class. So today we are going to do another comprehension. This is, this is from unit five, danger. Let's begin. Uh, please turn off your mics. Okay, so we're just gonna increase this in size so that you can all read it as well. Okay, this should be it. Okay, everyone. So this is it. Fiction. The following text is by the Australian writer Ivan Southall. It comes from Ash Road, which won the Australian Children's Book of the Year Award in 1966. In this extract, friends Velas, Graham, and Harry are camping in the bush in Australia. It is extremely hot and Graham has woken in the early hours of the morning. He's boiling water to make some tea on the camping stove, which uses uh, methyl um, uh, methylated spirits. It's a highly inflammable liquid, which the boys call mytho. Suddenly the boys are in terrible danger. Fire. <laughs> Dear students, please mute your mics. Fire. Striking hot, isn't it? You can say that again, but this weather's awful slow coming to the boil. The wind, I suppose. It's taken two lots of mytho already, said Graham. Have you, uh, have you got the lid on? Can't see when it boils if you've got the lid on. Put the lid on, I reckon, or it'll never boil. Don't know where the lid is, do you? Feel for it, it's there somewhere. Use your torch. The battery's flat, blooming thing. Must have been a crack, crook battery. Must have been a crook battery. So it means it's no longer working, the crook word, okay? Or broken or damaged, crooked basically. Hardly used it at, uh, at all. Now look what I have done. There's the mytho bottle knocked for six. You dope, cried Velis. Pick it up quick or we'll lose it all. The cork's in it. Graham groped for it, feeling a bit of a fool and said, crumbs. Now what? The cork's not in it. That's what it must have come out. It must have come out. That's what it must have come out. How could it come out? Honest to godness, to goodness. It's burning, howled Graham. A blue flame snaked from the little heater up through the rocks towards the bottle in the boy's hand. Or at least that was how it seemed to happen. It happened so swiftly it may have deceived the eye. Instinctively, to protect himself, Graham threw the bottle away. There was a shower of fire from its neck as from the nozzle of a hose. Oh my gosh, yelled Velas and, and tore off his sleeping bag. Harry, he screamed, wake up, Harry.
they tried to stamp on the fire but their foot were bare and they couldn't find their shoes they tried to soothe it with their sleeping bags but it seemed to be everywhere harry couldn't even escape from his bag he couldn't find the zip fastener and for a few awful moments in his confusion between sleep and wakefulness he thought he was in his bed at home and the house had burst into flames around him he couldn't come to grips with the situation he knew only dismay and the wildness kind of alarm graham and wellus panicking were throwing themselves from place to place almost sobbing beating uh, beating fatally futilely at a widening arc of fire every desperate blow they made seemed to fan the fire to scatter it further to feed it put it out shouted graham put it out it were it wasn't dark any longer it was a flickering world of tree trunks and twisted boughs of scar, scrub and scrub, uh, saplings and stones of shou- uh, of shouts and wind and smoke and frantic fear it was so quick it was terrible put it out cried graham and harry fought off Uh, fought out of his sleeping bag knowing somehow that they'd never get it out by beating at it that they'd have to get water up from the creek but all they had was a four pint billy can the fire was getting away from them in all directions crackling through the scrub down wind burning fiercely back into the wind even the ground was burning grass roots and fallen leaves were burning humus humus is a leaf mold okay was burning there were flames on the trees bark was burning foliage was flaring flaring like a whip crack and the heat was savage and searing and awful to breathe we couldn't we can't we can't we can't cried wellus what are we going to do they beat at it and beat at it and beat at it oh gee sobbed graham he was crying and he hadn't cried since he was 12 years old what have i done we have got to get it out harry was scrambling around wildly uh, bundling all their things together it was not that he was more level hearted uh, level headed than the others it was just that he could see the end more clearly the hopelessness of it the absolute certainty of it the uh, the imminent danger of encirclement the possibility uh, the possibility that they might be burnt alive he could see all this because he hadn't been in it at the start he wasn't responsible he hadn't done it and now that he was wide awake he could see it more clearly he screamed at them grab you uh, grab your stuff and run for it but they didn't hear him or didn't want to hear him they were blackened their feet were cut even their hair was sing- singed they beat and beat and fire was leaping into the tree tops and there were no black shadows left and there were no black shadows left only bright light red light yellow light light that was hard and cruel and terrifying and there was a rushing sound a roaring sound explosions and smoke smoke like a hot red fog 
no cried graham no 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 his arms dropped to his side sides and he shook the sobs and wellis dragged him away oh welle he sobbed what have i done we have got to get out of here shouted harry grab the things and run our shoes cried wellis where are they i don't know i don't know we have got to find our shoes they'll kill us sobbed graham they'll kill us it's a terrible thing an awful thing to have done where did we put our shoes wellis was running around in circles blindly he didn't really know what he was doing everything had happened so quickly so suddenly for peter's sake run. for pete's sake run shouted harry something in his in his voice seemed to get through to velis and graham and they ran the three the three of them like frightened frightened rabbits they ran this way and that hugging their packs and their scorched sleeping bags uh, blundering into the scrub even into the trunks of trees fire and confusion seem to be all around them the fire's rays darted through the bush it was like an endless chain with a will of its own and circling and entangling them sorry encircling and entangling them or like a wall that leapt out of the earth to block every fresh run they made for safety even the creek couldn't help them they didn't know where it was there might as well not have been a creek at all this way shouted harry a track they stumbled back down the track towards tinley at least they thought it was towards tinley they didn't really know perhaps they were running to save their lives running simply from fear running away from what they had done when they thought they were safe they hid in the bush close to a party contract uh, construction house partly constructed house they could hear sir- sirens wailing lights were were coming on here and there the headlamps of cars were beaming and sweeping around curves in the track they could hear shouts on the wind they could hear a woman cry hysterically they heard graham sobbing over all was a red glow okay everyone so this was your passage uh, let's answer these questions now over here you have to read this passage for detail and inferences again you have to infer what information is provided and you have to uh, infer the meanings and the connotations that it has okay uh, the inferences simple why is it so important that the cork sh- uh, should be in the bottle of methylated spirits when graham knocks it over ye hum to hinder binda badena thare da kai kwa nahi thi do te na ho rakha well why was it important for the cork to be in the bottle because these were highly flammable fluids so if they were uh, dispersed off or they leaked they could easily catch fire that is why it was so important for graham to keep the, to have the cork in the bottle now this information is not provided in the text you have to infer it 
from what is written in the text. This is why I'm using these passages so that you can understand that it's not always going to be that read the passage and you will find an answer in the passage. It's not always going to be like that. Sometimes you have to infer the answer from the given information. He does claim that the court should be in there. He does explain to you that what the bottle contains and how flammable it is. Based on that, you develop the link that why it should be in there because otherwise the flammable, highly flammable liquid would have spread all around and then it would have caught fire very easily. Okay, question two. Which verb is used to make the fire seem like a live creature? Okay, so they've used a verb in paragraph two to make the fire seem like a live creature. So let's find out that verb. A blue flame snaked from the little heated up through the rocks. A blue flame snaked from the little heater, uh, heater up through the rocks uh, towards the bottle in the boy's hand, or at least that was how it seemed to happen. It happened so swiftly, it was, it may have deceived the eye. Instinctively, the protect, uh, to protect himself, Graham threw the bottle away. There was a shower of fire from its neck as from the nozzle of a hose. Okay, there's been so many verbs. Let's see. The noun they've used is a snake. Snaked. Okay, sorry. Yeah, this is the one they're referring to. So in paragraph two, okay, I thought it was a snake. It is snaked. So this is a verb. This is not a noun. So since this is the answer, the verb that have, they have used to describe the fire is snaked. So it's not a snake. This means like a snake, moving like a snake, snaked. So you see the snake goes zigzag, zigzag, zigzag. So that is how the fire, the flame was actually going, was going zigzag through the fire. Because you see the flame moves in a very uh, peculiar fashion, okay? Uh, the pattern is usually a zigzag sort of one. It doesn't go like bluff and one go and just has a tinge to it. And then again, you don't know how the uh, liquid would have spelled. So maybe it was spelled in such a way, okay? Okay, paragraph two. Why was it a bad uh, mistake for Graham to throw the bottle away from him? Well, again, uh, most of the data is still given, but you still have to make an inference. It says that since the fire was coming towards the neck of the bottle, you see, the, since the liquid was still pouring from the bottle and it was highly flammable, when the fire caught on to that liquid, it just started to lap towards the source of that liquid because the only other source was inside the bottle. So he had to th toss the bottle. Now, the problem is, as he tossed the bottle, it was already lit because fire catches up very quickly. So since he saw fire going up the bottle, he had to toss it away from him so that he does not get burned. But that was a big mistake because now the burning fuel was spread all around them in an arc because as the bottle went, so it kept on spewing all that burning liquid all around them. So the fire actually spread due to this. Otherwise fire would have been contained in a, uh, in a small region which could have been controlled. But now since he threw the bottle away, it just uh, spewed all this burning flame, flam highly flammable liquid all around them in an arc. So this uh, was a grave mistake because uh, the fire spread so quickly due to this uh, throwing of the bottle. Why do you think the uh, writer has italicized the word it when he refers to the fire?
well, again, this is an inference. So what we can say about, because he, the writer does not tell us that why he has done so, but since it's an inference, we can infer our own meaning. Okay. So since uh, when you're afraid of something or when you have, uh, you have to focus on something, you use the word uh, in italics. You have to say it in a different tone. It has to be differentiated. So maybe for that reason, the writer to uh, emphasize on the fire and just not to speak the word. Sometimes you see uh, people are more like uh, that they would not speak a bad word. You see, uh, if you remember from the movies, the Harry Potter series, Hogwarts, they would never uh, take the name of uh, that uh, villain. I don't even know his name, uh, remember his name, Voldemort. So they would never say Voldemort because they were so afraid of him that we should not speak his name. Similarly, sometimes people you would have heard that they would not like to speak about the bad things. They would not say that you uh, don't take that name. Okay, so in that fashion, maybe he is using the word it to refer to the fire that they didn't want the fire to spread. The author even doesn't want the fire to spread but it's going to be a very bad thing. So he just refers to it as it. And then uh, to give this influence that it is the fire that he's referring to and to emphasize on the word, he has italicized the word. Paragraph, okay, question five, paragraph three, which adverb shows that the boy's efforts to beat out the fire were useless? Okay, let's go to paragraph three. Sleeping bag, but it seemed to be everywhere. Harry couldn't even escape from his bag. He couldn't find the zip fastener. And for a few awful moments it, in his confusion between sleep and wakefulness, he thought he was in his uh, home and uh, the house was uh, had burnt into flames around him. He couldn't come to grips with the situation. He knew only dismay and wildest kind of alarm. Graham and Wallace, panicking, were throwing themselves from place to place, almost sobbing, beating uh, futilely, uh, futilely at a widening arc of fire. Every desperate blow they made seemed to fan the fire to scatter it further to feed it. Now what do we have to find? Which adverb shows that the boy's efforts to beat out the fire were useless? But it could be futile. It could be uh, desperate. Both of these words. But I think it more relates to futile. Because every effort they made was futile. It wasn't going to do anything. So it just seemed more clear with every effort that this is it. Okay, question six, paragraph six. What did Harry understand more clearly than the others? Well, uh, the answer is clear. Okay, again, some information is given, but uh, what Harry understood because he was not the part of the fire, the process where the fire was started, he did not start blaming himself instantly. And he could see it clearly that the fire has spread too far and it would soon engulf them. And even they themselves could be trapped in the fire and get, be burned alive. So it was clear to him that he needed to collect this stuff and then run away from that place as fast as possible and go as far away as possible from the fire. Because the fire was clearly to him uncontrollable. It had already gone out of their hands to stop the fire spread. So it was best and uh, he could see this because he was not the part of the process that started it and he wasn't the one who was blaming himself for the fire and had to stop the fire. That is why the other two could not see this fire, the this thing as compared to Harry. Paragraph six, describe the different movements and sounds in this paragraph. Okay, let's go to paragraph six. 
Harry was scrambling around, uh, scrambling around wildly, uh, bundling all their things together. It was not okay. Hopeless, uh, he could see all their. Uh, all this. Okay, so I'm gonna okay <sighs> was uh, was hard and cruel and terrifying and there was a rushing sound a roaring sound explosions and smoke okay so all these were the sounds that were uh, there okay i still i forgot to discuss the movements but since the time is going to run out soon so what i'm going to do is i'm just going to try to finish the rest of the three questions that are left okay so you just uh, saw the movements over there as well uh So their hair was singed, black and feet were cut, okay, and they were hard and cruel and terrifying sound. And there was a rushing sound, a roaring sound, explosion, then smoke and smoke like a hot red fog, okay. And then they had these all these moments. They are all discussed throughout this passage. So you can just go through them and just come to them later on because we just have five minutes, so I need to finish this up. Paragraph seven. Why was it so important that the boys found their shoes? Because they wanted to run, and to run away, they needed their shoes. Uh, already, since both the other two, they had not found their shoes and could not uh, wear them uh, while trying to discard the flame or to get rid of the flame or to extinguish the flame. Uh, their feet were already cut by the different the thorns and everything that could be on the floor, the rubble, the rocks. and since they were trying to just desperately uh, get the flame out so in that they did cut their feet and now they could not run very fast very far and they had to run very fast and quite far so because the fire had already spread all around them and they and it was in all directions so they needed to have a way uh, they needed to be sure that they would run fast and uh, without have getting any cuts and more bruises or anything on their feet so that they could go as far away from the fire as possible because they never know that when will they get help maybe a kilometer from that place maybe 100 miles maybe uh, maybe 100 sorry miles you know 100 meters maybe 1500 meters maybe 2000 meters we never know so they needed the shoes to run fast and away from the fire paragraph 8 in what way was the boys running like that of frightened rabbits Uh, okay frightened rabbits so they were running like frightened rabbits written in the passage uh, paragraph 8 uh, their running was like frightened rabbits because since uh, if you see if the a rabbit is frightened it can run in all direction they can just run in all directions and they were just running away from the fire and wherever they would go they would see that the passage is closed due to fire where they would change their direction go to another place and see that this route is also closed due to fire so they were running like rabbits just trying desperately trying to find a way a passage out of the fire so that is why they have been referred to as rabbits frightened rabbits so they are just going through each and every side because they couldn't see they don't even know in which direction they have to go so they were just going like rabbits in all directions wherever they would see they would get this passage is closed they would go to another passage it would be closed they would go to another passage it would be closed so they were finding their way so they were running like frightened rabbits paragraph 9 when the boys finally found the protection of a partly constructed building what could they hear and see so at this point we do feel that uh, they did go to that partly constructed building and say, uh, and by that time the fire department had already been alerted due to the flame and everything and the smoke that would have been risen, rising from that place uh, because there are too many bush fires in australia every year and especially during the summers so the fire department is quite active so it does feel like they were hearing sirens and horns and the cars turning on the pavement on that particular track so it does feel like that the sounds 
uh, reveal to us that it does feel like that the cars were coming there and the rescue cars were included because they had the sirens on so uh, it does feel like that the fire trucks and other rescue vehicles were coming towards their uh, that site to extinguish the fire so it does also give us hope that the three boys would be saved so that's it for today you can do this whole exercise and uh, you can ask me any questions if you have uh, any further questions okay so yeah, i'll be available for answering any questions that you might have okay good luck everyone